Thank you. Um, I, I would like to start off like we always did in the Black Panther Party and saying all power to the people. <laughs> right on, all power to the people. Uh, first, I want to give you a little historical background. Uh, perhaps any of you may not know the history of the uh, symbolism of the Panther and where it comes from. Uh, the Panther comes from the South during the Civil Rights Movement in Lowndes County, Alabama uh, in 1965-66, around there, 64, 65, 1966, uh, pre-Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, which I was initially a part of. The symbolism uh, was from the uh, Lowndes County, a county that was 80% black, 20% uh, white, but was being dictated and cr controlled by the white races, the white 20%. Uh, blacks have no control over anything in their lives in that county. Um, so when the, uh, the voter rec when the voter registration rights bill was passed in 1965, you had uh, young blacks from SNCC, Student for Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, went to the South and began to organize those blacks into a uh, began so they could learn how to uh, vote. Most of the uh, people in the rural South were, couldn't read or write, and so they had to be enlightened and informed. And you had those whites who were illiterate as well, but were racist. And they had, the whites' political party had a rooster for its image, a, a crock. That was the image of the white races. So it opened it up for blacks to do the same thing. In order to be a political party, you had to have the iconic image for your party. And so that, uh, what you had is you had the blacks who seen these high school mascots, and they seen the sports teams, and they chose the Panther. And so the Panther of the symbol comes from the South during the Civil Rights Movement. This is to show you uh, in Lowndes County, pre-Black Panther Party, Vote November 8th, pull the lever for the Black Panther, and go home. This is in Lyons County, Alabama. Another thing I would like to do before I get into the images is to also give you some context to the uh, self-defense and the historical relevance of that and how that came uh, in regards to the, the uh, struggles uh, in the United States. You had Robert Williams and Mabel Williams, who were two African Americans who lived in Monroe, North Carolina who Robert Williams was one time the leader of the uh, NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. But because he believed in self-defense and defending himself against the Klan and the races, he was uh, kind of uh, the, the radical element in the NAACP. Uh, he had did a lot of things to, you know, blacks could not go into the swimming pools, not allowed to drink out of the water fountains, all these things he demanded, and he got in a lot of conflict with the racists and had to leave the country. Uh, he was because of threats on his life. Uh, he and his wife went to uh, Cuba, then they went to uh, Tanzania, and then they went to China. And this was the early 1960s. And when he was in China, uh, he used to, we used to see him on the front of Peking Review, sitting with Mao Zedong. Uh, he came back to the United States, I believe, in 1969. Uh, to Detroit, Michigan, where he stayed, where they refused to uh, extradite him back to Monroe, North Carolina, but the racists still wanted to lynch him. Uh, so he stayed there until our charges were dismissed many years later. This is a picture of Robert Williams uh, sitting with Mao Zedong in the early 1960s. Uh, it was one of his, one of the books that he wrote that we used to read a lot called Negroes with Guns. Yeah. It was also, we used to have the Red Book because the students, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale used to sell the Red Book in the early days of the Black Panther Party because the students at University of California used to like to read the Red Book. And so they would sell the Red Book to make money to buy guns and do the patrols in the community. I wanted to show you one of the uh, earlier images of the pig. This is the first pig drawing. Now this is before they took off, uh, I began to, at the bottom. That pig drawing was on four hoofs. But uh, as, and this was the first one I did because uh, I hadn't thought about the other one yet. 
And when I did this one, uh, Huey Newton uh, had, uh, we were working on the paper in the, in the, out of a studio apartment. We did, this is a regular studio, layout table, no layout table, just cutting and pasting. And he came in and said, we want to put the badge number in this pig drawing, uh, with, with the pig drawing every week, of uh, the police that were harassing people in the community. So the first one was uh, the pig drawing that you see here with this badge number is badge 206. This was the Oakland police that was shot and killed in Oakland, California when Huey Newton got uh, a wounded in 1968 when it started the Free Huey Movement. He was known as a bad actor in the community. So therefore, each week we were going to put the badge number of the police who were intimidating and harassing people in the community. Here again is what we begin to define, what is the pig? This is also a, um, this is when I began to have a vision of, and I thought about why don't I take that pig, stand it up on two hooks, keep the snort, and keep the, uh, all that, and the flies around it, and that became the pig. Uh, when I did this drawing, Elgis Cleaver, who was then the Minister of Information of the Black Panther Party, began to define what a pig was a low-natured beast that has no regard for law, justice, or the right of people, a creature that bites the hand that feeds it, a foul, depraved traducer, usually found masquerading as the victim of an unprovoked attack. Now, some of these images I'm going to go through quickly. Others I will elaborate behind uh, about because they are of much history, and because of the time uh, constraints, uh, I will not be able to talk about all of them. Here again is another one, and as you can see, this is an early history, of early uh, front page of the Black Panther Party newspaper. Understand the Black Panther Party newspaper, uh, first the illustration, the artwork dealt with the, the pig drawings, then the artwork that dealt with uh, uh, solidarity with people's struggles around the world. There's also artwork that was reflected in relationship to the social programs that we were involved in. And so all those things were involved in the Black Panther Party artwork. As we go along, you will see a lot of that. This image was dealing with Huey when the, uh, Huey Newton had got shot and the police had got killed in 19, uh, early 1968. Uh, when Huey went to trial and the, he was exonerated of killing the police, uh, the night, that night, the, we anticipated that there were maybe, we were some concerns that the Oakland police would be very frustrated behind the verdict and that they might try to do something crazy. So we had kids and young people in the office all that day. So we said we closed down early. And sure enough, that night, the Oakland police came by and shot up the office. They sprayed the office with bullets. The next day, the, uh, the chief of police, then was Charles Gaines, said, well, they were very frustrated because of the verdict and they were just letting off a little steam. They did not fire them from the police department. They only uh, uh, suspended them for six months with pay. This was called Pigs Want War, Panther Cool, Panther's Cool. Reagan attacks Elders Cleaver. Reagan, Ronald Reagan, who became the president of the United States, was then the governor of the state of California. The student body at the University of California had requested that Elders Cleaver, the photograph that you see at the top, requested that he come and teach at the University of California. But because Ronald Reagan did not like the Panthers or our, what we stood for, Ronald Reagan put pressure on the Board of Regents at the University of California not to allow Elder Cleaver to teach at the University of California. So this is why we call Ronald Reagan a pig. And so we say, speaking as the racist governor of California, I don't think Elder Cleaver should teach at UC. Now, also, Ronald Reagan was the governor of the state of California when the Black Panther Party went to the state capitol in 1967. And contrary to what everybody believed, everybody in the Black Panther Party didn't carry guns. Everybody who went to the state capitol during the times that you may have seen on TV did not carry guns. There were men and women who were part of the delegation who went with us to, to uh, Sacramento, California. When we went there to observe the, uh, the legislation of the gun laws that they were trying to change because the Black Panther Party was carrying guns in the community, patrolling against 
the um, oppression uh, that uh, reflected uh, in, pat in excuse me, uh, patrolling against the uh, police abuse in the African American community. And Huey Newton and Bobby Seale had studied the law and understood that we had a right by the Constitution, the, Constitution, the Second Amendment of the, the Second Amendment of the Constitution gave us right to bear arms. Within that context, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale did these patrols. Now, when they went on the patrols, they understood the law better than the police understood the law. They understood that you could stand 10 feet away and you can observe a young man or a young woman being arrested and not be interfering with the duty of the police during that particular time. So there was a very lot of level, uh, high levels of frustration on the police department because they didn't understand the, the Second Amendment of the Constitution and Huey Newton and them did. So what they did is they got this right wing uh, assemblyman, repre state representative, to try to change their local gun laws. So that was why we went to Cal Sacramento, California, it was to deal with and observe the legislation that was being passed in relationship to changing the local gun laws. But when we went to Sacramento on the state line, standing from here to this lady in the front, is the governor of the state of California, Ronald Reagan. So when we come on the line, all these young people are around him, and they see us coming with the guns. They come over to us want to know we're a gun club. And then Bobby Seale reads the statement, executive mandate number one, about the uh, concentration camps USA, which we call the prison industrial complex today. And then we go into the state capitol. We don't, we're not violation of any law. They let us into the state capitol. We walk through the corridors, go up the stairs, go up in the newsmen are, are, are trying to find out where the, where the chambers are, where the laws are being passed. When we get upstairs to the chambers, the Newsmen open the door and go into the chamber. The first thing the lawmakers and representatives say was get those uh, cameras out of there. Then we, the Panthers, follow behind them and they said, get those guns out of there. So we leave. And we go back out onto the uh, state capitol grounds. We stay for about five or 10 minutes. We get in our cars and we leave and go to a filling station about two or three blocks away. Then you see this motorcycle cop come by and he see all these black men with these guns, and he gets on his, his gets on his uh, his, uh, his walkie talkie or whatever it is, and he calls for reinforcement, and they come from everywhere. And so when they arrest us, they take the guns, and because the fact that we were within our law, within we were in the, within the uh, city limits, and we knew the law that you could not have bullets in the chamber of the guns at that time, they took the guns and they pump bullets into the chambers. They did all of these things. Uh, they arrested us, took us to court. We went to court. To make a long story short, they couldn't, they didn't know who had guns because everybody didn't have guns. And the guns weren't loaded. They were just there symbolically. And so what happened was that uh, they said, well, we want to make a deal. We said, okay. And Bobby Seale said that they wanted 11 of us to plead guilty to a misdemeanor, a minor charge. And I was one of those chosen to plead, to plead guilty. And he said that we would get non-supervised probation. And so we went to the court and we pleaded in the court. The judge asked, well, how you plead? We said, well, we plead guilty to the, because we want to get back and organ, continue on organizing on a day-to-day -day basis. And when we pleaded guilty, and we thought we were going home, and the judge said, no, no, y'all going to jail. So they crossed us up. And Bobby Seale went to jail for about six months. I think I did about three or, three or four weeks in jail. And you had others, little Bobby Hutton, the very first pastor, was 15, 16 years old, uh, also was incarcerated. So that was one of the very first uh, experience of understanding what the system and I work. And this is a picture of what we call community control of police, if you see the flower in the young man's hand. This is dealing with uh, little Bobby Hutton, who was the very first panther of the Black Panther Party. Uh, he, was 50, he was mentored by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. He was 15 years old when uh, he, and a half when he joined the Black Panther Party. Huey Newton and Bobby Seale had to get permission from his mother for him to join the Black Panther Party. 
And Lil Bobby was a very serious young man. The average age of the Black Panther Party and, and the initial phases of the Black Panther Party was between the ages of 15 and a half, 16, 17, 18, 19 years of age. Uh, I was 21 years old when I came in, going on 22. Huey Newton was 23. Bobby Seal, Elvis Cleveland, and a few others were 28 and 30 years old. They were old folks of the Black Panther Party. So this was a youth movement. This was not an old folks movement, but we also welcome anybody who wanted to come and work with us. But at the time when the initiative started, this was a youth movement. Little Bobby Hutton, on April 6, 1968, two days after Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated in the Memphis, Tennessee, uh, Little Bobby Hutton was assassinated in Oakland, California. He was shot over 17 times by the Oakland police in uh, Oakland, California. This is called Pigs Run Em Up. This is one evening when I had came back from organized with Elders Cleaver and Kathleen Cleaver in San Francisco. And uh, we had been out organizing all day. Uh, about midnight, the police came to us to the house, knocked on the door. Elders Cleaver asked who it was. He said, San Francisco police. He said, do you have a F warrant? If they had a warrant, it was legal. They could come in, we had no problem. But they say they don't have a warrant. So he said, well, you have to kick the fucking door in. And they began to kick the door in. And so what happened, though, is that the reason why this took place is because there had been threats on Eldridge and Kathleen's life. And so they had got, through our attorneys, they got the right to have a gun within their house for their protection. But Eldridge Cleaver could not buy the gun in his name because he was an ex-convict on parole. Therefore, he could have went to prison. So Kathleen was the one who was able to buy the gun. So it's obvious that the police were coming there hoping that they would find some illegal weapons. And then that would have been, uh, uh, that have been in that case, Elder Cleaver could have been charged with a, 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 a parolee in possession of a firearm, which could have sent him back to prison. 15 minutes ago? You've gone for 15 minutes. Oh, oh, excuse me. Not 15 minutes ago. <laughs> And so what happened is that when they kicked in, when they uh, came in, uh, I was observing the, and this is how I came up with the illustration, I'm observing the pigs, uh, and uh, I got one pig saying, what are we looking for? You got the other pig with the question mark, and you got the other one in the uh, toilet with his snort in the commode, and saying, where are all the guns? And, <laughs> And so thereafter, they did that about two, three weeks to a month later, they went to Bobby Seale's house and did the same thing. It was thereafter we wrote this executive mandate number three that you see at the bottom of the paper, where we say we would no longer allow the police to come and kick in our doors without a search warrant. Yet they had a search warrant, it was legal. We had no problem. They welcome to come in because we had nothing to hide. But we're just not gonna let them come and kick in our doors without a search warrant. And we refer, we refer to a situation that took place in the 1940s in Chicago with a gang called the Al Capone Gang, who was the rival of another gang on the other side of town. And what happened then in that instance is that the Al Capone Gang had some of its members dressed up like police. And they went across town and the other gang thought they were real police and they slotted them. So we say we, won't, we would never allow that to happen again. So at this time, is when you had begin to have the police infiltration into the Black Panther Party. And you had the agent provocateurs and the criminal elements that they began to infiltrate into the Black Panther Party to begin to start the shootouts that took place all across the country with the Black Panther Party. You had over, according to Bobby Seale, you had over uh, 14, 14 policemen were killed and over 28 Panthers were killed in these shootouts all across the country during the early history of the Black Panther uh, based on that uh, 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 executive mandate, you had a young man named Bobby Heron who wrote a point, and I illustrated the point. It says, knock, knock, who's there? The pigs. Got a warrant? Don't need one. I'm coming in. Bang, bang. Oink, oink. Off the pigs. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, during the 68, 68, 67, 68, there were many rebellions in the United States. There are over 100, 200 rebellions, riots, resistance movements across the country because of police abuse in the United States. And you had the war in Vietnam going on at that time in 1968. 
So it's, it's hell outside, it's hell inside. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. America being spelled with three Ks, not the KKK. It was something that I didn't create, but I thought it fit well with this picture. Here again is another one. It's on Babylon, used the biblical word to coin America, which Elder Cleaver began to uh, use that word. Uh, you have the pig standing in the middle of the Pentagon, ready for overkill, with missile between his toes, a lynching rope in one hand. He's got a blood sucking vulture on the butt of the gun. He's got drooling dollar bills out the eyeglasses and out the mouth, got hand grenades in the other hand. And this is 1968, and this is the Pentagon. And you had, in New Haven, Connecticut, you had Bobby Seale and, and Erica Hugger, two Panthers who had been framed for a murder of a Black Panther, which was in, eventually were found not guilty, and the Asian provocateur was found guilty and sent to prison. You had Kent State, Ohio University there, where you had four white students who were shot, shot and killed by the National Guard for protesting against the war in Vietnam. In Augusta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, you had black students who were in rebellion on the campuses and gun battles on the campuses in the United States and many more of the campuses during that time. You had the Vietnam War, you had Cambodia, you had Laos, you had the struggle of the Palestinians and many, many other things taking place in 1968. You had John Carlos and Tommy Smith who gave the uh, all power to the people sign the fist salute. Uh, there were many discussions about that. A lot of people don't know that history. Before it took place, before they even went to the Olympics, there were Panthers, there were uh, uh, people from the student unions and others in the community who they had discussions with in regards to what they could do when they went to the Olympics in regards to showing the basic human rights violations against the African American community in the United States. Because they, all of the Olympians could not come to a consensus, this is what they decided to do when they went there in 1968. And you have to understand, when they went to those Olympics, prior to the Olympics, in Mexico City, there were over 63 students who were protesting, who were massacred by the government in Mexico City during that time as well. This is say the Olympics, he runs on, he gets down on the ground, he runs the race, he comes to the uh, winner's line, he stands up on the podium, and he stands and he's still holding up the American flag. And when it's over, a nigga is a nigga is a nigga. It don't make a difference if you're Olympian. Don't make a difference if you're a doctor. Don't make it if you're black or people of color, you're gonna be profiled in the United States of America. You had over 600,000 young African Americans and brown people in the United States in New York City who were profiled only because of the color of their skin. Just recently, that was a lawsuit. You had, uh, they, they, they said less than 1% of those who they stopped and they profiled and checked them down and searched them, less than 1% had any contraband. But when they did the research, they found that 45% of the white people that they didn't search had some kind of contraband. So that's, that's institutional racism. Get out of the ghetto, get out of Africa, get out of Asia, Get out of Latin America, U.S. imperialism. Get out of the ghetto, get out of Latin America, get out of Asia, get out of Africa, U.S. imperialism. It's all the same, local police, National Guard, Marines. I mean, we know today it's all the same. The military race, they are militarizing the uh, local police departments all across the country. All the uh, military equipment that's coming from Afghanistan and all the other locations where they have it, they are now giving it to the local police departments. Ha, 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 good old American peace. That was Henry Kissinger, to the Secretary of State, I believe, soon to your right, and Richard Nixon, who was the President of the United States, both former criminals running the government. This is in Vietnam, the Vietnamese say this, and I quote, if the enemy refuses to get out, annihilate him. This is a huge, little bit right now on caricature as, as the U.S. imperialists wind up all the little toys, send them off to war. 
and they become conscious over there and they come back and they turn on you, you the US imperialists. A lot of them joined the Black Panther Party. Many of those who were in, in military did join the Black Panther Party. This is showing you what war does to human beings, the psychological impact of war. Today, you got XGI veterans that you don't hear about. Every day, you got Vietnam veterans committing suicide, not just Vietnam veterans, excuse me, today you have those who are in war committing suicide all across America today. Our fight is not in Vietnam, free the GIs. Our fight was not Vietnam. The Vietnamese wasn't caused of unemployment. The Vietnamese wasn't caused of indecent housing. <clears throat> the, the Vietnamese wasn't caused of police murder. The Vietnamese wasn't lynching us. So our fight was not Vietnam. Our fight was right in the USA. This paper called Pastia, these were La Sieta de la Raza, the seven. This is the same paper. These are Latino brothers who were charged with the murder of a San Francisco policeman. They weren't able to defend themselves. They had no money, they had no lawyer. So we helped them get a lawyer and we helped them get money. Uh, and we shared our paper with them for four, four or five issues so they could plead their case to the public. And uh, they were our comrades. And eventually they were found not guilty of killing the uh, San Francisco policeman. This is an imperialist, nursing all these little, little imperialists. All these countries that the U.S. is nursing here are directly or indirectly involved in the colonization of other people of, in the third world. Now that, that particular image I did when I was in, uh, when I was in uh, North Africa, in Algeria, in 1969, when Algeria had the real progressive government. Uh, we had uh, liberation movement status there. We had people there who were in exile. This is called the Zionist puppet, of, Zionist puppet state of, of imperialism, U.S. imperialists and associates. This was done about 19, 1968. This is when you're sending the, uh, those uh, unmanned Sputniks up into space. And we said, whatever's good for the person has got to be bad for us. And I, here you have the pig up in this, up in here with the gun saying, hey, handle those slaves with, with care. We're gonna need them for Mars, Pluto, and all those other planets. <laughs> then you got the slave getting off the slave pig ship saying, I knew we should have stopped this shit before it got off the ground. <laughs> then you got the pig over here with a pick and shovel saying, okay, goddammit, don't take 400 years this time. That's in relationship to building up America. Ah, white only, at last. This is the space. <laughs> <laughs> we want decent housing this for the shelter of human beings. Here you have the sister protecting, trying to protect her baby against the, uh, the rodents, shooting up the hole, and here you have the rats coming around attacking the baby. Here you have another interpretation of that. Or maybe she had was more involved politically with the signs in the back of the freeway, death to the fascist pigs. Save the children. Again, save the children. This was about uh, freedom. Look when Bobby and Erica Huggins, who I talked about in New Haven, Connecticut, were incarcerated playing off of that with the badges, but also playing off the conditions with the word oppression. Alabama, California, Mississippi, Louisiana, Chicago, New York, America, freedom is a constant struggle. When I talked about the young men and the battles that went on the campuses in the United States earlier, this actually was an actual photograph of one of those young people who were on the campus, and I thought it mirrored this image that I had done in 1967 called Black Studies. I just want to testify, I'm not going to sit around any longer. I got freedom on my mind. We shall survive without a doubt. Those are little panther cubs. They were the babies of panthers. These, if we had alternative schools, uh, 200 kids in our schools, and uh, 
had a, a waiting list of over 2,000. It was considered one of the best alternative schools in the state of California. They used to send kids to our school that said were incorrigible. And we said, all you have to do is show them, tell them to love and care. The young kids in our school used to have their own disciplinary committee called uh, Method of Correction. When young people mess up in the school, they come in front of their peers, and their peers would determine what the, uh, what the, what the uh, judgment would be in regards to their violation of not speaking out of school, not paying attention to the, to the teachers and what have you. A lot of people don't know that Rosa Parks, the well-known civil rights leader, came and stayed with us for two weeks at our school, the Black Panther School. All this is documented. All power to the people. We had many social programs. We had free health clinics. We had free medical clinics. We had the free food giveaways. Free breakfast for school children in the morning. The free breakfast for school children in the morning came the uh, internal number one internal debt to the uh, security of the United States at one time. We talked about uh, sickle cell anemia, the disease that predominantly impacted African Americans in the United States. Didn't know they had the disease until the uh, Black Panther Party began to do across the country do the testing. You had a young man who had the disease in the Panthers who wrote his book later, saying the only way he found out about it was when he took the test in the Black Panther Party. Then he found out why he was feeling so ill all the time. It was because he had the sickle cell which there is no cue for to this day. Germ warfare declared, declared against blacks. You had hundreds of black men who were put in this test course uh, in, in the Tuskegee uh, experiment in 1929, 1929, 1930, somewhere around there, to 1940, and it was called, uh, and it was in regards to the syphilis, and they didn't have no cure for it, but in 1947, the government found a cure for syphilis, which was penicillin, but the sharecroppers who they put in this test did not get the penicillin. They would continue to have sex, pass it on to family members, go blind. All of these things happened. It was in 1972 when they, this uh, experiment was exposed because you had some progressive reporters who could not get it written, uh, published in the mainstream papers. So they gave it to the alternative papers and the Black Panther Party newspaper, and we began to put this information out in, in our papers, and that's when the tests stopped in 1972. But none of these African-American men who were in this study ever got the penicillin, which was available in 1947. They also did the same thing in Guatemala in the 1940s. This just came out recently, in regards to where they did uh, the same things, they, in, they, uh, they uh, injected the, uh, the, the uh, women, the street workers, with the, the, with, the, with, the, with the syphilis and the gonorrhea and passed it on to soldiers. And they also did it to young orphan kids so that they could have a, a whole pool of where how they could ex test this experiment and study in relationship to this disease. And they were trying to do it in a, a way that it would be under the radar so nobody would understand what was going on. Uh, this one is different. We had, a senior for, we had a senior program called SAFE, Seniors Against a Fearful Environment, where we used to take them shopping and pass and take them to the banks to cash their checks. They used to come have the social environment come together. And you had in Oakland, California at that time, they were talking about spending, I think it was $54,000 on a helicopter to patrol crime. And what we said is that if they really want to uh, deal with crime, they would invest that, invest that $54,000 into the young people to take the senior shopping, to take them to cash their checks. That way you cut into the crime, but when you use a helicopter, you're not invested in the community at all, period. Vote for Survival Free Food Program. This is one of our free food programs that we have. Hypertension kills, I'm hungry, I'm unemployed, I'm black. Down with exploitation now. All I got is nothing. Maybe he's a messed up psychological war veteran. All I got is nothing. 
Here's one of my images that were remixed by the Cuban artist in Cuba, Asphal, uh, an artist called Asphal, an organization of solidarity with people from Asia, Africa, and Latin America. They used to mix, remix a lot of my images and send them out around the world, which was fine during that particular time because it was in solidarity. But a lot of people used to go to, who went to Cuba to work in the sugar canes, to help with the sugar cane uh, season, the cropping and stuff like that in the United States. They used to think that I was copying the Cuban art for many years. And, and they would come back and say, you didn't do that art, we've seen that in Cuba. But that's just one of the images that I just showed you. That's the other image, Let me, I'll go back again. As you see those two images, then uh, that's one of them. That's the other one where they put them both together and it made that amazing, beautiful poster. Here again is another one of the images that they used of mine and did it in color and did the, uh, the solidarity with the African-American people, August 18, 1968, and four different languages. That's the original artwork for that one, which was a small drawing inside of the newspaper itself. This one, Afro-American solidarity with the oppressed people of the world. This is also one dealing with the apartheid system of South Africa. At the time, I didn't have any other book, but a, call, a book called The House of Bondage that was dealing with the, with the oppression, repressive conditions in South Africa. So I tried to take the uh, photos out of there and to illustrate in a collage kind of thing of uh, the repression that breeds resistance. And it's like a spark that lit the prairie fire, this is the repression. It goes on and out of that flame, when that spark lets the prairie fire, out of that flame comes a freedom fighter. And it says, repression breeds resistance. Here again is this simple one in 1987. This is after the Black Panther Party. It just says, down with apartheid on the backpack of the young man. And he playing with the little cutie pies. This one is, uh, says, we, uh, we, uh, we have to fight, although we have to die. We have to hold up the blood-stained banner. We got to hold it up until we die. My mother, she was a soldier. She had in her hand the freedom plow. When she got old and couldn't fight anymore, she said, we got to get up and fight anyhow. My father, he was a soldier. He had in his hand the freedom plow. When he got old and couldn't fight anymore, he said, we got to get up and fight anyhow. Now, with all our soldiers, we have in our hand the freedom plow. When we get old and can't fight anymore, we got to get up and fight anyhow. This is one of the brother of self-determination, preaching self-determination, defiance to his young, young one. I, Gerald Ford, and the 38th puppet of the United States. President of the United States is a puppet. They don't control nothing. Corporation control that, everything. This is an uh, indictment Black Panthers wanted for conspiracy of exposing America. And that little rat was then Richard Nixon and then Mitchell, John Mitchell, who's Attorney General. This, is on, this was on Halloween. And it said, trick or treat, pay it, trick or treat. You got, <laughs> you got Richard Nixon, who was the president, and Spiral Agnew, who was the vice president. Both of them was criminals. They had to leave the government in disgrace. Both of them kicked out of the government. Class brothers. I wonder if Nixon is bugging us now. I wonder if Obama is spying on us now. Cost of surviving is criminal. Event in two black men's lives, drum ties wide. This is prison camps USA, the unknown slaves. Today it's called a prison industrial complex. It's about profit, it's about making money. And when you privatize prisons, you gotta have a product because you're in a private business and your product is human beings. If you don't have enough product on your shelf to make money, then you're not gonna make a profit. So that means that there have to be a certain amount of people that's going to be in prison for a private prison to make money. 
political prisoners of USA fascism. That was Bobby Seale and Huey Newton back in the day. During that period, they were political prisoners, some of the first in the Black Panther Party. You got then you got three of the New York 21, all and all political prisoners. This is 1969. Uh, Tupac Shashur, Shakur's mom was a member of the Black Panther Party, and she was one of the New York 21 who were uh, charged with over 157 charges, but eventually went to court. Within four hours, all the charges were dismissed. Bobby Seal called kidnap. This one was called kidnap. I went to the office one day. There was, we could tell that something was going on, but we couldn't tell what it was. That's a strange thing we always observed around our office and what was happening. That evening we left, we went to the filling station about two blocks away. All of a sudden, it was two or three cars up. All of a sudden you had the federal marshals swoop down on us with machine guns. They snatched Bobby Seale out the car. They took him off. We had Panthers who followed him. He took him to San Francisco. We got in touch with our lawyers. They had took him to the federal building in San Francisco. And they were taking him back to Chicago because this is 1968. And I believe he had spoke at the Democratic Convention against the war in Vietnam with all the other activists and radicals outside of the uh, convention. And so there they were charging him with uh, inciting to riot. And this is why they snatched him up like that and took him back to Chicago. Uh, we said, hello, Black Panthers. We will soon make it possible for all of you to be with your chairman, the art of kidnapping by the FBI. During the court proceedings, uh, I didn't want to do a uh, just a court illustration, but to kind of interpret what went on in the courtroom. During the court proceedings in Chicago, Bobby Seale, uh, lawyer, Charles Gary, well-known activist lawyer who died recently, uh, some years back, uh, had to have a minor operation, and Bobby wanted to defend himself in the court, but they refused to allow him to do that. Every time they would mention his name in the court, he would object and want to cross-examine the person or, uh, or interject something into the, into the court. Instead of them taking him out of the courtroom, they chained and gagged him in the courtroom and kicked him over in the chair. Never in the history had this ever happened before. Only other time was when you had uh, the angle of three, three other Black Panthers who also were chained and gagged in the courtroom. This is a picture of New Haven. When This is what they really were trying to do in New Haven, Connecticut, when Bobby and Erica Huggins were on trial. They were trying to electrocute him in the uh, lecture chair during that time. Uh, Huey Newton didn't like the picture. He said it was too real. But Bobby Seale said he liked it because it brought a lot of attention to what really was trying to go on at that particular time. This is when Huey and Bob, when Erica and Bobby were released from New Haven, Connecticut. This is hallelujah, the might and the power of the people beginning to show. Uh, this is about justice. This is uh, Fred Hampton. Uh, you can go to uh, YouTube and you can look up the murder of Fred Hampton. If you haven't, if you know nothing about it, you go there, you'll see the story of an eight day agent provocateur who stole a car, took it across the state lines in Chicago. They told him if he worked his way up into the Black Panther Party and filtrated, they'd make a deal with him. He did just that, and he set up the whole murder. We got documents where now that show that this whole whole uh, raids came down from the White House. The first initial raids in 1969 was to take place in Seattle, Washington. But uh, you had the Alpha Panthers there who kept getting these calls from this black FBI agent who wanted to talk to them and they refused to talk to him. And they finally said, let's go see what this guy is talking about. And he told them that they watch out for these these raids out to kill him, but they thought it was like psychological game they were playing. And sure enough, it, did, it was true because what happened, come, the documents now show that they had went to the local authorities, the mayor and the local politicians, and because they refused to go along with the raids, that they, they had to disband it, and they went and did it in Chicago. Uh, and so they killed Fred Hampton, Four days later in Los Angeles, California, after the murder of Fred Hampton, there was a 16-hour shootout and a 16-hour standoff and a five-hour shootout with the LAPD. Carl Hampton, not no kin to Fred Hampton, Black Panther, Houston, Houston Texas. 
cleaned up the community, seniors could go out to houses, no prostitution, no drugs, no nothing in the neighborhoods. Got the altercation with the, uh, the police there. Two weeks later, the police come back. Somebody tells Carl Hampton that the police are out there. You had the church who let the police go up into the church tower. And when Carl went out into the street, you had a police sniper in the church tower who shot and killed Carl Hampton. <clears throat> Same thing happened in New Orleans. You had the police come dressed as nuns and priests. The young lady come down to comes through the door and they shoot her through the door, but she survives. I got I mean, he comes to 45. Okay, I can go for 45. I got about 15 minutes in. Okay. Uh, uh, George Jackson, who was, uh, you can look up George Jackson, who was a, a, a common criminal who became political in the uh, Black, and joined the Black Panther Party. Uh, and we started the first chapter of the Black Panther Party inside prison, in San Quentin Prison, was our first chapter of the Black Panther Party. This is called Homecoming. Uh, Sonia Sanchez, a well known poet. This was the first cover of her uh, uh, poetry book, and this is the image also in the exhibit. This is showing our solidarity with the, the, the first people of, of, of the original caretakers of the land in America, the American Indians, and they were, uh, they, they are our aim. American Indian movement was our ally in, in, during that period. See, this is Boycott Lettuce, Cesar Chavez and the farm workers in solidarity with them. This is all showing that African Americans were also sharecroppers at one time. This is Malcolm X, the warrior. Malcolm X, the father, who was all said by any means necessary, was the slogan that Malcolm X talked about. This was Dr. King, who Dr. King began to talk about the greatest purveyors on earth. And he was talking about the United States government. When you, 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 all you got to do is listen to his speech, why I'm opposed to the war in Vietnam. That was the speech that, one of the speeches that got him assassinated. Because he says, he, why, they were trying to say, let me stay on the path of, of civil rights. But he was beginning to deal with human rights. So he was not staying on the path and dealing with what they thought he should have. Therefore, when he began to talk about the war in Vietnam and uh, racism and going beyond the boundaries of the United States and solidarity and revolution in relationship to turning things upside down in the United States, that was the things that began to trigger in relationship to them that they had to get rid of the most part, one of the greatest articulate communicators that, that we had at that particular time. Here's another image of him. This is all power to the people. These are more recent images. All these that you're seeing um, are more recent images. Here again, that was in the uh, exhibit as well. It's a damn shame how the government won't give us the needy a helping hand. Another interpretation, vote for survival, free food programs. Here we are living in the land of plenty while we, the people, starve. Here's the many resources programs that I talked about, the free bus into prison program, the free ambulance program that we had in, the, in our first chapter in the South, because the ambulance wouldn't come into the South, so the Black Council wouldn't got certified as ambulance drivers and the community bottom of ambulance. We had free food giveaways, the senior programs, schools, alternative schools. Here again is a remix of that one. I remember the remix. That's called The Bluest Eye. This is based on a book by Toni Morrison about a young woman who lived through a horrible time in her life. Her mother thought she wasn't gonna be a pretty, well, she wasn't pretty as a baby and thought she was gonna have a horrible life. And, but in the essence she did, she was raped, compared racism and all those other things. On the last page, Toni Morrison said that uh, she could have been assassinated. And for me, that meant that you didn't have to be assassinated by a bullet, you could be psychologically assassinated. This is about reparations, red, white, and blue. This is an exhibit with Japanese Americans requesting reparations, African Americans requesting reparations. 
Here again, also dealing with the figures, spelling out the word reparations, chained together. This, this symbol here is a Dugan symbol from West Africa, which means you are a slave of him whose handcuffs you wear. This is also what I did with a, a small book company that wants you to do that same thing as a small book. This was a, 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 a woodcut done with, in collaboration with Fabiana Rodriguez, a, a young, amazing Chicano artist who we were doing about uh, the issues of, uh, of justice. Power to the people, justice now, down with ex exploitation. This is, again, dealing with the symbol of Af shape of Africa and the word peace. Here is again, peace. The struggle continues from one generation to the next. Peace heals, war kills. The new world order, the same old order. Man made money, money drove man mad. In the election in 2012, you had for sale the corporate home, the jackass, sold corporate home already, and both of them spent over a billion dollars. Obama spent a, a billion dollars, the Democrats. The Republicans could be in ten billion dollars. A ten billion, that kind of money don't come from twenty-five dollar donations from the people at all. Period. 1989, I was asked to do Black Scholar Magazine on the question of where black politics was going. And as you see, they got both eating out the same trough. Never had the public. Ain't no difference. That's the toxic waste. The Republican Party, the Democratic Party, a two headed snake. This is called Kill List. Barack Obama signed the bill. Well, they got sick, you should kill him. Well, they get together, he gets together with, behind closed door, and they decide who they're going to assassinate in the world. When he went to get the Nobel Prize, he didn't give a peace speech. He gave a war speech. So that makes him a Nobel fraud. Commander-in-Chief. He can close down Guantanamo Bay, but he ain't not going to do it. This is called Real Talk. Mama, President Obama sure can talk good. Yes, sweetie. Yes, sweetie. It's his job to make us believe things will be okay and doo-doo don't stay. <laughs> now, see, and even in the context of all that, he's still confronted with the same racism everybody else, every other black person is. Because they don't want to take curses from him because he's a black man. This is spells war, and this is dealing with drone warfare, intended collateral damage, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Africa. Every drone and so-called terrorist they kill with a drone, they kill 28 innocent people. This is what war does to human beings and young people. Over thirty percent of the people, I believe, in 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 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in who've been, uh, I mean, you got this all over the world, you got this all in Africa, you got it everywhere. Law, uh, this is what we don't see. This, we don't see the depleted uranium and what it does with two eyes, no eyes, no arms, three arms. We don't see all that. They don't show us that. I was contemplating peace. It's relative, the word peace. Peace can be peace, peace can be attack. Peace can be bloody. Private military contractors, millions of dollars, billions of dollars. We don't know if these chairs you're sitting on is part of military contractors. They got all this subsidiary. They had McDonald's over there. They got all that stuff over there. Frat. The world is frat. Genocide. <laughs> the deliberate killing of a large group of people, especially those of a particular ethnic group or nation. 
guilty of genocide. Arab, Muslim, Islam, U.S. coded word for terrorist hate discrimination. Black male, U.S. government coded word for hate, discriminate, kill. Police terror, USA. Much as things change, much as things may change, some things stay the same. Why did they get to brutalize and kill us and we get to blame? That's what Richard Bell, in collaboration with Richard Bell, collaboration with Richard Bell, collaboration with Richard Bell, collaboration with the Zapatistas in Chiapas, where they took my images and interpreted them into embroideries with Mayan emblems, symbols in them. These were created by the uh, Mayan Zapatista women collectives. There's six of the embroideries on, on, on uh, exhibit now in Brisbane at Minali Gallery. This is when we went into the uh, Chiapas and the Zapatista community to do some painting. In this building, we stepped up on there on the uh, platform. They can't afford to, uh, ha uh, uh, money or anything to give you. So you bring your own paints, bring your own clothes, you bring all these things, your food, your water, everything. <laughs> and you, you use bathroom, you go to the outhouse down the hill with a hole in the ground. And it was bats flying over us at night. And it's open at the top all of it here. But it was an amazing experience. Went that, I've been there three different, different occasions. This is after we uh, were there for two days, and this is what we've done with that particular time with the painting. The next time, that's me standing in the door when I was invited there to, we was going to paint, do this Zapatista store. And we went back a year later, and this is what we did with the store. Collected. These are collective artworks of uh, about 15 uh, artists together. Uh, here is the little symbols that I contributed along with the idea that want to have a raised spirit to it that you see in a lot of some of the work that I've done. As you see, that's the Im image I showed you. A lot of stories behind that. Here's the other one I did. This was a collaboration in, the, uh, in Urbison, Manchester with some young kids whose, exhibit, whose work was in the exhibit in Manchester, England in 2008. This is the exhibit itself, one of the most powerful exhibits we had. Uh, we had a desk with books connected to the desk that we required reading in the Black Panther Party. They could also sit down and listen to history of the Black Panther Party, a look at audio in conjunction with the overall exhibit. They were for, this is the opening night uh, for that exhibit. They had over 43,000 people. This is in, uh, in New Zealand with the Maori, collaboration with the Maori using the twist symbol, where you show and show some of the essence that people go a different path, but they will always come back together. And this is a single twist. And so this is what I came up, overcoming oppression is our path to unity. And that's what it represents in Maori language. Also, uh, the title of it was, If You Were to Live Here. And when I looked on the internet, the British flag was to always be at the top. The other flags was going to be to the right or below the British flag. So what I did is I put the Maori flag at the top, put the British flag at the bottom, and turned it upside down. <laughs> this is on the streets of Urbis, I mean, in, in, in New Zealand, Auckland, New Zealand. This is the first visit when I was there for 45 days. And they had published the images all across the, on, the, on the streets. This is, in, uh, uh, this is in Argentina, and Marta, Mar Marta Plata, try marching for young people, over 5,000 people. Over 5,000 young people who attended, and they come from all the countries around, uh, Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, the whole bit, and they were, it was overwhelming support in relationship to how they responded to the presentation I gave, and I wondered, why was that? And what I began to realize and see that they could see in those images that I was presenting some of the same challenges that they were confronted with in their countries. This is uh, toxic waste. That's to deal with immigration rights in, uh, in the United States. And I went to the border with 50 other writers, artists, and photographers, and painters to learn more about what was going on. 
And what happens is that this is the illustration I come up with. Unfortunately, don't have enough time. I got about five or ten more on it. Should I be spending? This one's called Free the Land by Any Means Necessary or Divest, Divest, Down with Apartheid. This is an image I did um, in, in conjunction with uh, nine other artists uh, dealing with the struggle and dealing with the tree. And it says uh, Free the Land. And it was, uh, yeah. Um, nine different artists who were participating in this. Particularly, there was an artist from from came from Palestine. There was one who couldn't, who could not, uh, but who was in uh, who was in Jordan and was able to come. But there was another who was in Gaza who couldn't get out. So that that image was interpreted. You had an uh, Arab American, Palestinian American. You had a Japanese American. You had a Jewish American artist who interpreted the latest uh, artwork from Gaza. You had uh, uh, Native American artists, and you had Ch Chicano artists who all contributed. And this is the uh, <coughs> Total Mural, Mural Project in Oakland, California. Health is wealth. I like to say, yes, non toxic. This was solidarity with the Haitian struggle. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the UN uh, troops urinated in the water, and feces in the water, and you have the cholera epidemic where you have over 8,000 Haitians have died from the cholera epidemic. Mama said HIV AIDS is an act of genocide in Africa and it's an epidemic in our community. Why? Because you can't get the generic drugs for a long life because there's no profit in the generic drugs for the great, all these uh, pharmaceutical companies. Black lives matter because all lives matter. Ayos is in Napa, 43 faith. That's because that's in, in, in uh, solidarity with the families who's in Mexico were the 43 students who were murdered by the government and the military recently. Father's love, mother's love. That's uh, kind of inspired by the Oakland school that the Panthers had. This is the 1% of youngsters who are uh, fighting and gangbanging and killing each other, who, and they call mental bondage. You got them youngsters who shoot, don't do nothing but Look bullets, talk bullets, and that's called mental bondage. They don't realize that they're becoming an endangered species. But the government don't care. They said the government, they don't care, let them kill each other. They don't care. And when the youngsters get inside these prison institutions, they don't realize it's like modern day slavery. And a lot of it's about profit, making money. Then you got the prison industrial complex targeting people of color. It's about profit, private property. Freedom, Amir Abu Jamal, young brother who everybody world around knows him. He's, right now he's uh, in a hospital because they snatched him out of prison. Nobody knows where he is. They're hoping that they can find him, hoping that he's still alive. And you got a lot of people on our side uh, right now working on his behalf. Panthers who were tortured, literally tortured, in New Orleans, 1971. You had the San Francisco police, the, oh, the, uh, the U.S. Marshals in the same, uh, go to L.A., I mean, in the L.A. police, go to New Orleans, wanted to question these Panthers about a, a, a San Francisco police precinct that had been shot up and the police had been killed in the precinct. And they took them in the room and they put them in, stripped them down, and they started asking them questions that they couldn't answer because they didn't know if they were in New Orleans. They started beating them. They put plastic bags over their head. They took out cattle prods. One of them said he lived on the farm, so he knew what they was. And they started taking them up to Anderson's under the testicles. And they say, we say, what is, okay, what you want us to say? They say, don't worry about it. We got to, right here, you just sign. And they signed it. And when they took them out, they tried to bring the charges up of, uh, in, in uh, New Orleans, 
And the judge said, well, it was done under duress. It won't say torture. So therefore, they were threw the charges out. They tried to try them again in San Francisco. They threw the charges out. 40 years later, they came back trying to say that they had this new evidence. And in the, in the final analysis, they had no evidence and had to dismiss the charges. And they had fabricated the evidence because they claimed they had a cigarette lighter that had the Panthers fingerprints on it. They took it to five different laboratories. The fingerprints did not match any of those Panthers at all. Eddie Conway, political prisoner USA, released after 44 years of injustice. Just released six months ago. Free the Angola three, three Panthers. One got out about 10 years ago. One got out and died two days later after his conviction had been turned returned two times and they refused to let him out. The third Panther conviction who is in there now Conviction has been overturned three times, and they're still fighting not to let him out of prison. This is another interpretation of all one, justice and combination together. And this says, in support of our comrades, political prisoners, USA, freedom fighters, fighters for peace, justice, and freedom, particularly the struggle against recognized cruel and oppressive conditions, government's inhumane policies and actions. And the last one is Free Political Prisoners USA, all power to the people. Thank you much.